Okay, so we can start. So, hi everybody, it's a great pleasure to have as today's speaker, Fabio Pintore from INAF IAS of Palermo. Fabio had uh, his PhD at the University of Padova. Then she was, uh, he was a postdoc in Cagliari and in Milano. And since 2020, he has a permanent position in Palermo. Uh, his uh, research is mainly focused on uh, the study of accreting compact objects at the high and very high energies, but actually uh, his uh, research has covered a broad area, um, from the study of isolated neutron stars to the dust in the interstellar medium to the gamma ray bust and so on. Uh, Fabio has uh, an impressive uh, publication score with more than 20 papers as a first author, uh, many citations. Um, uh, he is a member in several important collaborations uh, such as uh, uh, ASTRI and the CTA and so on. And uh, today he is uh, presenting uh, a uh, panoramic view of uh, the multi-wavelength properties of uh, X-ray ultraluminous sources and uh, the open question related to their nature. Okay, so thank you, Matteo. Uh, many thanks to everyone to be here and to have invited me here. So it's my first time uh, uh, in, in IRA, so I'm very glad to present you my, my activities. And uh, <clears throat> so in general, uh, I, I work on uh, um, on uh, accreting compact objects, as I said, so sources which are generally observed in the X-ray uh, band because the accretion is a mechanism uh, that produces X-ray emission. But today I would like to talk to you about a peculiar class of um, uh, X-ray sources, which is called ultraluminous X-ray sources. So um, just uh, to be on the same uh, on the same field. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me introduce this kind of uh, X-ray sources. So, uh, in the in the in the future, I'll uh, I'll call them ULX just to be uh, faster. And uh, these kind of sources are point-like uh, X-ray um, targets, uh, which are mainly extragalactic. So there is just one in our galaxy, but um, it's a little bit different from the rest of the population. But in any case, these are extragalactic uh, sources uh, characterized by not, 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 uh, is, uh, is there a pointer okay if not no problem uh, if not I, I can keep going uh, so these sources are characterized by very high x-ray luminosities we are talking about 10 to the 39 just like a bottom limit and we can go up to 10 to the 42 arc per second. So luminosities, which in general are not observed in the X-ray sources in our galaxy. So these kind of sources are very, very bright. And this, this is the reason of the name ultraluminous. So if we look at the luminosities in the X-ray and we, you know, and we use the uh, Eddington limit uh, that you probably know, um, which scales uh, uh, like the mass of the of the compact object, as you, as you can see the, the formula in the bottom here. So the Eddington limit is the um, is the limit is the luminosity limit where the radiation pressure uh, can um, can win the can, can beat the uh, run pressure of the accreting matter onto the compact uh, onto the compact object. So as you can see from from here. The luminosity, uh, the Eddington luminosity for a one solar mass uh, compact object is around 10 to the 38, but we are talking about sources with luminosities higher than 10 to the 39. So if we want to explain such high luminosities, we can probably or maybe increase the, uh, the, uh, the mass of the compact object. So 10 to the 39 is the Eddington limit for a black hole of 10 solar masses. But if we um, consider sources with luminosities up to 10 to the 42 arc per second, we need to consider very, very massive black holes. And I'll discuss in a while um, if this is possible or, or not. 
In any case, this very high luminosity is, uh, um, can also be thought like the emission from the central region of the host galaxy. But uh, actually, we can exclude it because, as you can see from this image, most of the ULXs are located in the outskirts of the of, of their um, of, of their host galaxy. So these kind of sources were discovered in the 80s by the Einstein satellite. Uh, but now we know more than uh, 100 and uh, uh, sorry, 1,500 or more or less 2,000 ULXs. So the catalog is now definitely um, in, is now definitely rich and plenty of sources. But in the practice, uh, we know just a very uh, tiny fraction of all these uh, uh, known ULXs because most of the observations are, um, are poor, uh, more of the observations in the X-ray, I, I would say, are poor with very short exposure and very uh, limited accounting statistics in each source. So these kind of sources are um, for sure uh, binary systems. So we have a companion mass, which transfer matter to, towards a compact object, a companion compact object, and um, this, um, this um, periodicity uh, was found in some ULXs. Here you can see a few examples of um, orbital periods, for example, here in the optical with HST data. And uh, so nowadays we, um, we all think that uh, ULXs are um, accreting contact compact objects in binary systems. Okay, so. As I was saying uh, um, before, if we want to explain, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so as I was saying, and the, in, in order to explain their high luminosity, uh, we can think that uh, uh, it's only the compact object mass which can uh, uh, we, that, that, that can be scaled in, in order to explain uh, in order to explain them. So <clears throat> if we think at the luminosities in the range 10 to the 39 up to 10 to the 42, we should introduce a kind of uh, new uh, a new kind of black holes which are called intermediate mass black holes. These are located in the region, between stellar mass black holes, so the black holes in our own galaxy, in binary systems in our, in our own galaxy, and supermassive black holes. The masses of these objects is around 100 up to um, 100,000 solar masses. So <clears throat> for a long time, ULXs were thought as the best place where to look for this kind of uh, uh, objects, um, which are peculiar because, I mean, uh, we don't know many of them in this, uh, in many, many black holes in this, uh, in this region. So is this uh, um, like this? So we can think that ULXs are actually the best place where to look for intermediate mass black hole. Well, if it, it's like this, uh, um, the properties of ULXs should be exactly the same like the black holes, uh, the accreting black holes in our own galaxy, just um, a rescaled version of the galactic black holes. So let's see if this is true or not. So in galactic black holes, we can think to a system like this. So the compact object in the middle, then the accretion rate, which produces an accretion disk around the compact object. And uh, this is a, the accretion disk. And sometimes uh, you can also have uh, jets emitted uh, close to the compact object. Most of the emission is uh, in the X-ray. Uh, while the, the jet can be also in the, in the radio band. So <clears throat> if this is the scenario and this is a, an accretion uh, called, uh, an accretion uh, regime, which is called sub-Eddington. So the, the Eddington limit is not uh, uh, overpassed. And we should see something like this. So maybe you are not so used to this kind of uh, diagram, which is the, hysteresis cycle for uh, the uh, galactic black hole binary systems when uh, they go uh, into uh, an outburst. So 
the luminosity when they are in outburst uh, can rise very uh, quickly and the uh, spectrum and, and, and the state i would say is very very hard with uh, power law uh, with, with a power law um, spectrum with photon index around uh, 1.5 so in general below uh, below 2 in this uh, uh, hard state, uh, we can also have the emission from jets. As you can see here, there is the indication of the presence of jet with these green uh, uh, lines. So we can also observe radio emission. Then the uh, outburst continues and the sources enter into this uh, soft state uh, in which the spectral uh, properties are um, practice uh, thermal properties. So there is a Thermal, uh, um, thermal emission, a uh, black body, I would say, and uh, um, and uh, this is the uh, the um, the state where jets are in practice quenched, and then at the end of the outburst, uh, the source uh, uh, go back to to quiescence, uh, passing through this uh, hard intermediate uh, state. So let's see if ULX have a similar behavior. So if we can see. These two states, hard and soft, and soft, like in the in the galactic black holes. Well, if we have a look at the spectral properties, uh, we can see rapidly that uh, ULXs are different. So this is a, an example of a typical hard state, hard spectrum of a of a galactic black hole, and this is the soft spectrum of a, a thermal uh, state. So if we compare these two uh, main states of the, of the galactic black hole binaries with the typical spectra of the ULXs in the, in the top of this uh, figure, you can see that they are quite different because uh, ULXs can be soft, can be hard, can be broadened. And uh, in most of the time you have at least two components. You can see that uh, there are two, um, two um, uh, humps in this, uh, in this spectrum, both in the soft and in the hard. While the broadened one is just like a, 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 a thermal component, but broader than the typical thermal component observed in the thermal states of the galactic black hole binaries. So if we just look at these spectral properties, we, we have to say that, gamma, that ULXs and galactic black hole uh, have different spectral properties. In addition, we can also add an, another ingredient that, uh, just go back, that in the thermal state of the galactic black hole binaries, this soft component uh, um, has a luminosity which goes like the fourth power of the inner disk temperature. So there is a correlation between the luminosity and the temperature of the, of the accretion disk. In the ULX is, is exactly the opposite. We have an anti-correlation between the two, uh, the, the two quantities. So this is clearly a, a different, uh, a different uh, accretion regime, I would say, or at least accretion, accretion state. In the right panel, you can see, um, um, you, you can see um, several ULXs with different uh, uh, properties of their uh, uh, spectra. So we have uh, very soft uh, sources, as you can see from here. And uh, if you go to the top, you can see very hard uh, sources. But all of them are characterized by one thing, which is a cutoff in the spectrum at around 5 keV. If you look at the... Yes. Can I ask you uh, yes. something? For this is ULX, you have variability you have different uh, yes exactly exactly different times, so. this is what i I'm, I'm showing here so these are for, for each source uh, these are the two most extreme spectra shown by each source so for example uh, here we don't have very great uh, very big variability but for example uh, here yes or here yes we have very uh, very uh, robust variability what are the time scales uh, it's completely random. Uh, you can have variability on time scales of a uh, few hours, sometimes a few days or weeks. Uh, it's, um, it depends on source to source. So it's, um, it's hard to tell a priori. Sorry, do, yeah. do they follow the same uh, hysteresis cycle of the black hole binaries? Yeah, that's and this the... is the first one. And the other one, I was confused by 
your previous or the next block. The, the, the thermal state, uh, yeah. the one you call the thermal state is, the, is for black, black hole binaries? Or yes, or? this one is for black hole binaries, yes. And, uh, and where is the thermal state in the hysteresis cycle? This is the second question. The so, thermal state in the hysteresis cycle is here. The soft uh, state. With no hard component. We, there, is, there is sometimes a hard component, but it's very weak. The dominant one is the, is the thermal component. And the, the big soft excess is the soft intermediate, is, is what you call that the one, because in the other one. Uh, do you mean here? Yeah. No, the, because the, I, the, I mean. The, the magenta line. In the magenta line. The here. magenta line here. Yes. Uh, this is a, another kind of. Uh, uh, I, 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 I didn't discuss about it ah, okay. because it's uh, another peculiar source, which is a, a super soft interluminous X ray source. <laughs> so, sources uh, which are very, very soft, but uh, it's another. It's okay, another so many, many lines. But yeah. Anyway, I'm just going back to the first question Do they follow the same hysteric side? Yeah, exactly. That's the point. No. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I, I didn't want to. The, the answer is not. They are they are different from this point of view, uh, and uh, so what, what what I'm saying is that the, the the spectral properties are different. In the particular, if you look at the power law component, for example, of the galactic black holes, they have uh, uh, cut off at uh, hand, at tens or hundred of keV. Uh, whoops, sorry. While in this case, we have cutoffs at very uh, small energies, about uh, 5 keV. And this was uh, confirmed and discovered by Nostar, uh, which observed all these sources, showing that uh, uh, most, of, most of them, I, I would say the, great, the greatest majority of them, have this uh, cutoff at around 5 uh, for uh, four, 5 keV. So the spectrum goes down below 10 keV, more or less. And this is quite uh, peculiar because we don't see this in galactic black holes, uh, in, gal in galactic black hole binary systems. In addition, also the variability, the short term variability, so the variability of the light curve uh, is different. Because if we go back to here, the series cycle, we have uh, for the galactic black hole binaries uh, very high variability in the hard state, uh, while the variability is more or less suppressed in the soft state. In the case of the ULXs, we have the opposite. So if you look at this plot, this is the variability, the fractional variability, which is actually the variability, the remiss variability of the light curve as a function of the spectral properties. So this is a, an hardness ratio. You can see that all the soft sources, the blue one, uh, the, the blue points in this plot are definitely more variable than the hard sources. So this is a completely the opposite behavior with respect to galactic black hole binary systems. So the answer to my first question is, are we looking at uh, just a, a scaled version of the galactic black hole X-ray binaries? The answer is not. Your Alexis have their own phenomenology. Uh, it, it, is it clear or did you understand the opposite? Sorry. <laughs> No, they are different. So the properties are completely the opposite as I, as, I, as I show you. So the variability is reversed and the spectral properties as well. So <clears throat> if, this is, uh, if this is the, um, the answer to my question, so, in, so the ULXs are probably not the best place where to look for intermediate mass black hole. Probably only some of them can be intermediate mass black hole, but uh, they should be very, very uh, bright, like the hyperluminous HLX1, but I don't enter into the details of this. But in any case, uh, we now don't think that ULXs have intermediate mass black holes, but we are looking at a very different, uh, um, very different uh, uh, kind of uh, um, accreting uh, compact objects. Uh, so probably stellar black holes uh, or neutron stars, uh, so in, with masses in the range uh, 1.4, 80 solar masses, if we consider very massive black holes, uh, but which are not accreting sub eddington like the galactic black hole binary system, but super eddington which, which is a regime uh, not uh, 
uh, very expected uh, um, years ago, um, and uh, it was not uh, think uh, it, it wasn't thought that it, it was possible to agree at this uh, regime. So the most striking uh, discovery was the uh, finding of the first pulsating ULX. Okay, so in the in the data of one ULX, which is M eighty two X two. Uh, it was possible to find uh, a, a coherent signal, so a pulsation. If we have a pulsation, we are talking about a neutron star. So ULXs doesn't have, or maybe, um, doesn't have intermediate mass black holes, but uh, they definitely have neutron stars because we, we found one of them. And uh, other five, you, uh, other five uh, uh, neutron stars were also find uh, were, were also found in uh, in uh, in other sources. Here, just an example: NGC fifty nine or seven ULX one, NGC seventy uh, seven seven nine three P thirteen. So <clears throat> these uh, uh, these ULXs uh, challenged a lot our understanding of the accretion onto compact objects. Because we are talking about something uh, quite weird. Uh, think about this: the Eddington limit of a neutron star is 10 to the 38, more or less. But these sources uh, are peculiar because their luminosity goes up to 10 to the 40, 10 to the 41 for this source, for example, and per second. So we are talking about uh, two orders at least of magnitude higher than the Eddington limit for a neutron star. So this is quite uh, quite weird and uh, um, and uh, challenging a lot our understanding of the accretion properties on onto compact objects. So the, uh, the the pulsations of these neutron stars are are around 0 0.4 1.5 uh, uh, seconds. So they are quite uh, slow, but this might be a bias of the observations. If you have a question about it, uh, I'll, I'll answer why we have a bias on the observation on the on the spin period. Okay, so if we are talking about super Eddington accretion, what's the scenario? Well, a few slides before I showed you that we have a standard um, a standard behavior for the graphic black holes where we have an accretion disk, a standard accretion disk, and sometimes a gel. In this case, we have something definitely different because the accretion disk is not is not expected to be standard. So geometrically uh, thin and optically thick, but it's actually expected to be puffed, so like a, like a donut. And locally, the luminosity of the disk can exceed the Eddington limit, so the radiation pressure is so powerful that uh, uh, the matter of the, of the disk can be uh, pushed away. So we have strong outflows, and these outflows can also be turbulent and uh, optically thick. So all the properties uh, that I um, showed you before about ULXs, about their uh, spectral and the temporal properties can be explained in, in just with this image. So the hard ULXs, so the, the, the sources with hard spectra uh, and, uh, and uh, low variability are sources observed more or less face on. So we are in practice, our line of sight is into the a uh, funnel of the of the outflow. Uh, so we are looking the region closest to the compact object. This can be a black hole or a neutron star, as I, as I said. And while the softer ULXs uh, with higher variability are those for which the inclination angle is uh, higher. So our line of sight enters into the into the wind, its turbulences, and uh, uh, the wind is expected to be thermal. So the reason why we have the soft emission, and uh, as I said, uh, can be also turbulent. So uh, the the blobs that from time to from from time to time encounter our line of sight uh, can create the variability, the RMS variability. And so this is the um, the, the, the the scenario that uh, nowadays we consider as uh, valuable for uh, ULXs. Uh, in addition, the presence of uh, outflows uh, were uh, confirmed uh, by, um, by the, um, the discovery of blue, shift, uh, blue shifted uh, features in the spectra of some ULXs. The blue shift is around uh, 0.2 C, so 
very fast outflows. And, uh, <clears throat> and also because in uh, optical and also radio band and infrared band, we found uh, um, optical, so, sorry, we found the nebulae around uh, the uh, UL axis. So here you can see some examples uh, of different nebulae. And uh, these are very, very big. We are talking about uh, nebulae with sizes of 100 of parsec. Uh, if I'm not wrong, this one is uh, 200 parsec time uh, 300 parsec or something like, uh, something like this. So uh, they are also, also called the super bubbles. And uh, probably these are uh, powered by the strong outflows produced by the, uh, by the UL axis in the, in the middle. So <clears throat> the very energetic is, uh, um, is due to the uh, accretion uh, onto the compact object in the, in the UL axis. So the strong outflows which are produced by the UL axis can feed this, uh, this nebula, producing uh, the, uh, the shape that you observe, uh, observe here. So <clears throat> we have many, many uh, pieces of evidence that uh, uh, ULXs are for um, sources uh, accreting super -editor. And uh, <clears throat> as, I, uh, as I told you, uh, we definitely know that there are at least six neutron stars in the ULX population. And you can ask me, yes, but only six for a total of 2,000 2, ULXs in the whole population. So it's a quite a small number. Uh, how, how can you say that, uh, um, how can you say that uh, uh, all of the ULXs are indeed uh, stellar mass black holes, stellar mass uh, compact objects are creating above the Eddington limit? Well, actually, you don't have to compare this number with this number. But you have to compare this number with the number of ULXs which were observed so much in the X-ray to have enough data, so high quality data, to detect the pulsation. Okay, and these are just a small uh, sample. We are talking about 30 objects. So we have six pulsating ULX in a total of 30 more or less objects studied enough to detect pulsation. Okay, so uh, the fraction of neutron stars in ULX is, is actually high. We are talking about 30% uh, percent more or less. So um, we know that there are neutron stars, but uh, it's not possible to exclude that also there are uh, black holes. So what's the relative population of black hole and neutron stars in the, in the ULX? Well, the best way is to look for indirect uh, properties of the ULX. So this is one of my, um, my research uh, topics. So uh, look for new uh, neutron stars in uh, ULXs by looking at uh, uh, um, not direct uh, uh, properties of the, of the ULX. Because of course, if you find the pulsation, you know that there is a neutron star. But if you don't find the pulsation, and I didn't tell you that the, I didn't tell you that the pulsation is uh, transient. So sometimes you can find it, uh, sometimes not. And there are reasons for this, but uh, not clear, not so so not so clear. But in any case, uh, what I want to say is that if we don't find the pulsation, we need to look at uh, different uh, properties to find the new neutron stars in the UL axis. So we know that all the pulsating neutron stars are transients. So this means that you have um, a source which is uh, more or less stable in flux and uh, uh, without any reason, it goes down in flux. So it goes to quiescence most of the time or has very rapidly uh, decay in, uh, in flux. All the pulsating ULXs are like this, okay? We have from time to time this switch off of the emission. Um, another possibility is that we look at the spectral properties. So here this is a, um, a sample of ULXs, uh, ULX spectra. Three of them are neutron star. So look at these three different panels. The rest of the plots are um, unknown, are known objects. I, um, I ask you to find the biggest difference biggest differences between the spectra of neutron star in, in ULX and the spectra of uh, 
uh, ULXs with unknown objects. In practice, we are looking at, ve at very similar spectra, not very clear the, 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 the differences between them, but actually we might uh, look at uh, a, a subtle feature, which is in the spectra of the ULX pulsars, which is uh, the uh, spectral, sorry, the hardening of the spectrum. It seems that uh, um, all the, uh, the pulsating ULXs have, um, have a spectra which, has, which are in general harder uh, than other sources. So maybe this hardening of the spectrum can be an indication of uh, the presence of a neutron star in a, in a ULX where the uh, compact object is uh, unknown. Okay, skip this one. Um, another thing, another uh, feature of these uh, sources, uh, the pulsating ULXs, is that they have superorbit superorbital uh, variability. Um, so these variabilities are um, about uh, um, are, are of the orders of tens of days up to hundred of days, and uh, these superorbital variability are, are observed more or less in all the ULXs uh, with neutron stars. And uh, why I call them superorbital and not orbital, like uh, the orbital uh, period of the binary system, because uh, from the timing properties of the neutron stars, uh, we can, uh, from, so fr from the study of the pulsation of the neutron star, we can infer the properties of the uh, binary system, so the period of the binary system, and uh, um, the periods uh, of this system, the orbital periods of this system uh, are around uh, a few days. But uh, here, the, the variability, the superorbital variability, variabilities are definitely higher, the orders of uh, uh, tens of days up to hundreds of, of days. So this uh, superorbital variability is not well understood uh, yet, uh, but it's uh, present in all the pulsating ULXs. So the best way to look for new neutron star, and I'm going to the finish of the talk, is to uh, look for probably these uh, properties. And, uh, um, and here I would like to show you uh, um, um, a quite peculiar source, which is um, unfortunately the picture is not so good because of the light, but in any case, uh, this is a, a, a very peculiar source in the galaxy NGC 50459. Uh, it's a spiral galaxy at uh, 10 megaparsec of distance, and uh, this source, uh, X7, is the most intriguing source of this uh, galaxy, at least in terms of uh, ultraluminous X-ray sources, and uh, uh, it, uh, um, it um, is located in a star forming, close to a star forming region, with a companion star of 20 solar masses. So this source was uh, complete, was almost ignored uh, till uh, 2017. You can see here that we have just a few uh, XMM observations, uh, sorry, channel observations uh, and the one XMM observation. Uh, these observations, in any case, uh, are very, very uh, small and uh, limited in uh, counting statistics, and uh, only a few swift observations. So this was a a boring source till 2017, but uh, after this year, we started a monitoring with both XMM, NUSTAR, and SWIFT in particular, which showed uh, a peculiar behavior. So we are seeing a source which is uh, flaring from time to time. And this was not expected, and I would also uh, add that um, it's uh, not uh, so common in ULXs to see this uh, flaring activity with variability of uh, uh, just, uh, just one week between uh, uh, low flux and the high flux. If we, <clears throat> uh, we um, analyze this, this data and uh, we perform a long scale long scargol analysis, so we look for uh, uh, periodicities in the light curve, we can see two peaks, which are not so powerful, but just above three sigma. One can be excluded because uh, it doesn't cover um, two, two periods, so it's uh, longer than the, the light curve, more or less. So we, it's better to exclude it. But the first one, uh, can be a reasonable uh, period 
for these uh, uh, for the light curve of this source. The periodicity is around 240 days, and you can see here there is a good agreement between uh, the light curve and the periodicity. But uh, you may also note that the uh, very the uh, peak of the variabilities are actually not uh, uh, not so or better not completely suitable for uh, several points of the of the light curve. Why? Well, actually, because uh, if we look at the XMM Newton observations taken in 2019 and 2022, 20, 22, when the source was more or less at this, uh, sorry, at this uh, luminosity, we found another short-term behavior, which was um, another flaring activity. So we have a flaring, act a superorbital variability and Overimposed to this superorbital variability, we have also this flaring activity. The flaring activity is completely uh, randomic in time. We don't have any clear indication of quasi periodical variability, but uh, we note that uh, in practice, all of, the, all of the flares have the same peak luminosities. And this is uh, unusual. Okay. So if we look at the uh, at the um, uh, sorry the hardness ratio of the soft band and hard band, you can see that uh, there is a clear variability in terms of spectral properties between the persistence, so the the, the flux before the flaring activity, and the uh, and the flux at the um, at the flaring state, and this is observed in both observations. So. If we uh, create an hardness intensity diagram of this source uh, using all the XMM Newton observations, so also this one, which is uh, one of the oldest observations taken in 2001, if I'm not wrong, uh, you can see that uh, the source can stay in uh, three clear spectral states. So this is the intensity, and this is the hardness. So two states are quite uh, comparable, same, uh, arden, same hardness, more or less, but different intensity. And another one is uh, brighter and clearly high, uh, clearly um, harder. So if we extract, for example, two, um, two spectra resolved in intensity and hardness for these two regions, we can see something like this. So this is the, uh, spec the spectrum of the two different states in uh, flux. And you can see that we have um, an emission which is more or less compatible with, with, between the two states for uh, energies below 1 kV, while above 1 kV, we have the variability. So the spectrum becomes very hard. And uh, while in the in the persistent state was uh, softer, so the soft component was dominant, while in the hard state the hard component is dominant. So we have a clear variability between these two spectral states. <clears throat> okay, so we have all the ingredients for this source in order to think that we are looking at uh, another neutron star in uh, one in this uh, source because uh, we have very hard spectra. We have uh, high variability. We have a superior superorbital uh, periodicity, and these are um, all three features observed in the pulsating ULXs. So we cannot exclude that also this source uh, is hosting a neutron star. If it's hosting a neutron star, um, we can uh, try to explain the flaring activity. So the switch on and switch off that we observed here. So this. Uh, the switch, this switch on of the flares and switch off after a while, in terms of uh, a mechanism which is well known for the accreting neutron star, which is the pro uh, propeller uh, uh, effect. So in practice, we have to think about, about this. We have a neutron star with a disk around. The magnetic field of the neutron star can uh, uh, drive the matter towards the polar caps. And for this reason, we have the pulsation of the neutron star. And uh, this, this can happen only if the magnetic uh, uh, radius, so the radius where the uh, matter is uh, driven by the, 
by the, the the accretion matter is driven by the lines of the magnetic field is uh, smaller than the corrotational radius. So the radius where the, uh, the, the, the disk velocity around the neutron star uh, is, uh, um, is uh, uh, equal to the, uh, to the velocity of the, of the, of the magnet magnetic field lines. So if we have this, uh, uh, if, if this uh, situation is uh, uh, satisfied, so the magnetic radius is smaller than the corrotational radius, uh, we have accretion. But if the magnetic radius is, for, for some reasons, uh, uh, higher than the corrotational radius, we start uh, the so-called propeller, uh, propeller regime. And uh, the accretion is completely inhibited towards the neutron star because the magnetic fields, um, the, the, the magnetic field lines rotate, fa uh, rotate faster than the accretion disk. And so there is a centrifugal barrier of the accretion matter, which uh, which uh, uh, avoid the accretion toward the neutron star. So, if we think that uh, this uh, um, accretion phase and propeller regime is uh, also acting in this source uh, during these activities, uh, so here we have, for example, propeller when it's persistent uh, at low flux, and here it can be while uh, it can be instead in the accretion regime. So we have propeller, accretion, propeller, accretion of propeller, and so on. So we are in a, in a situation where the uh, magnetic radius is very close to the corrotational radius, and it, uh, it, it, uh, it becomes a little bit higher and a little bit smaller from time to time. And this scenario can explain the, this, the sorry, this scenario, um, means that uh, if we have a neutron star in this source, uh, to explain this jump in luminosity between the two states, we need to consider a neutron star with an accretion, uh, sorry, with a, a spin period of the order of the millisecond. So we are talking about uh, the first millisecond pulsar in a ULX. Unfortunately, uh, we couldn't check if this is possible or not, because we still need uh, uh, observation in X-ray, uh, which uh, um, which uh, have uh, a readout, readout time uh, so small in order to observe this uh, periodicity of the millisecond. The available XMM Newton observations can allow us to find uh, um, to find pulsation up to um, half second, so not less than this. And so uh, we are still uh, um, answering, still uh, sorry, requesting new uh, XMM Newton observation in a in a timing mode, which is a modal uh, a mode which al which will allow us to uh, unveil if this uh, uh, source hosts uh, really a neutron star uh, with a millisecond period or or not. So this is my last slide, and uh, just to say that. Uh, a lot of open questions are still uh, um, present for ULXs. We needed to understand what's the accretion rate, the mass of the compact object, how many neutron stars and black holes are in the ULX population. And uh, we don't know uh, what's the nature of most of the companion stars in the ULXs. Um, we, an, an important uh, uh, topic is to study the magnetic field of the ULX pulsars and so on. And last but not least, also to understand if we can also find intermediate mass black holes in the most uh, bright uh, ULXs. So uh, I finish here. Uh, I, um, I, I thank you for the attention if you have any question. Thank you very much, Fabio, for the nice talk. So do you have any questions? Okay, pretty ignorant question, but what are the ratio properties of ULXs? The radio properties, well, actually, uh, we have information about the radio, but for the bubbles, okay? And uh, some uh, uh, ULXs have this radio, babo, uh, radio bubble uh, around them, uh, some associated to the existence of jets, transient jets, so emitted by the compact, uh, 
the central object because uh, uh, we could find uh, um, uh, the um, the lobes of the jet in the radio in the radio emission and usually the emission is around uh, 100 uh, microjansky more or less at five gigahertz and um, so um, we we still don't know if these radio properties are only due to a jet or only to, due to the jets emitted by the ULX mm -hmm. or also by the outflow, which in some way encountered the interstellar medium around the source uh, and there is a central television. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that will depend on the angular resolution that, that you can constrain radio vision to. Well, uh, well, this is a, 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 an important point, yes, because uh, most of the sources are quite far away from us. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we are talking about uh, MESA megaparsec of distances, so we need the VLA. We don't have so many VLA observations of the sources, but at least for the closest, uh, uh, we have some data and not not all of that. The pulsars are not found in radio, so radio pulsars uh, and pulsars are totally different. No, yes, yes. Because radio detects uh, of easily millisecond pulsars. Yes. If, if they emit. Yes, radio. but uh, yes, but these are too far to be okay. detected uh, in, in radio. And then we have the accretion process here, which uh, completely inhibited the, the radio okay. emission. So you have that the dominant process is the accretion, not the radio emission of the pulsar. If it was isolated, uh, yes, maybe you can try to <laughs> look at the radio signal, although these are quite far away. But uh, but the accretion process is the dominant one. So if we want to find the pulsation, we need to look at the X-ray data. Okay, I have a question too. Um, so I was wondering. There is a question there. Okay. So my question was that uh, I was wondering if uh, the emission of the pulsating uh, component is uh, above the agiton limit for ultraluminous X-ray parsers or not? And if yes, how is it possible? Well, um, that's an important point because um, we still don't know, um, uh, or, or better, to, to answer to your first question, uh, I would say yes. The, the the luminosity of the only pulsated signal is above the Eddington limit for a neutral star. So, for example, in NGC 5907, this one, this one, uh, the luminosity is uh, higher than 10 to the 40 arc per second, up to 10 to the 41. So we are talking about uh, Two orders of mag almost three orders of magnitude higher than the end limit for a neutron star, which is instead 10 to the 38 arc per second. So <clears throat> it's not uh, uh, clear how to explain uh, uh, the accretion onto the onto the neutron star when the luminosity is higher than the than the Eddington limit. The possibility is the magnetic field. Uh, a key to explain the this high luminosity is the magnetic field because if you have a very high magnetic field, I would say something like uh, 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14, or 15 Gauss. So, high, general of the um, the magnetic field of the magnetars in our in our own galaxy, um, the accretion is possible because the cross um, uh, cross section of the of the scattering of the Thomson scattering is uh, uh, reduced by the magnetic field. And so you can have accretion onto the, onto the neutron star. But actually, this is a possibility. And uh, we don't know if it's, uh, it, it can be confirmed or not. Because uh, uh, if the magnetic field is high, we can explain this accretion. But then there are, are other problems uh, that cannot uh, uh, be easily solved. So we cannot explain other properties. Of the ULX or the pulsating ULXs. So, probably the magnetic field is not so high, but uh, it's uh, a little bit uh, smaller, but uh, still high with com if compared to the, galactic, the uh, to the galactic neutron stars. And I'm talking about 10 to the 13, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 uh, Gauss. So, um, a, a, a border uh, magnetic field. And uh, 
I don't know if I answered your question. Yes. And yes. I think you, it was one or two, the, I don't remember. No, no, he, it's a great question where if uh, it is above and how is it possible. Ah, so okay. Also, question that you have. Um, I probably missed a uh, uh, step at some point. You, you see this uh, periodicity in the fluxes, and uh, you see this is clearly orbital motion. Uh, and you talked about the, the, in the in the first slides, you mean? In the first slide, but then also again in the end. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I can imagine there are many other processes that bring uh, a, lot, a periodic signal. Pulsar is an example where you don't have binary and you still have a periodic signal. So I was wondering. Yes, but the periodicity the here is definitely longer than the typical. Okay. So Cephates. Um, um, yes, it can be possible, but actually, uh, the thing is that uh, um, for the pulsating ULXs, uh, you know for sure that there is an orbital pe period due to the binary system because you can study the pulsation from the, the from the temporal properties of the pulsation. You can infer the properties of the of the binary, okay? The orbital period, the distance between the two, and uh, and so we definitely know from that that uh, um, in this case uh, we have uh, periodicities from binaries and not from other sources. In addition, cephids are not so strong in its rays, right? I know, no, I was just saying uh, examples of how the periodicity we find, but. Then the, the, the follow up question is that if this allows you to rule out uh, for other sources, for instance, the intermediate uh, mass black hole uh, scenario, well, the completely oh, different mass range. That's well, the, inter the intermediate mass black hole, uh, as, uh, as uh, the, the problems uh, I was mentioning in the, in the talk. So, if you have a, an intermediate mass black hole uh, in, in these uh, ULXs, uh, you should see. Uh, properties which are similar to the galactic black hole binaries. If they are too different, uh, we are talking about something different, unless to, to think that uh, um, the accretion rate and the accretion processes are the same, uh, are the same if uh, the mass is just scaling. Okay. If, uh, if there are other properties which are due to the intermediate mass black hole and we don't know completely about the scenario, yes, maybe it's possible also to, to, consider, to, to consider them. But if we look at the at, at not so exotic uh, uh, scenarios, we, we don't think that intermediate mass black, hole, black holes are in the ULXs. Yeah, Again, the point, why rule out the intermediate mass black hole? Because they are not scattered versions of binary. In the scenario which uh, ULX would be an intermediate mass black hole, would be a binary system. Uh, no, it can be always a binary system. So, uh, binary system. Also, if there is an intermediate mass black hole, this, it's not the binary properties that uh, exclude if uh, the compact object the compact object is an intermediate mass black hole or not it depends on the properties you are looking at if these properties are too different uh, from accreting uh, accreting black holes uh, that we know quite well in our own galaxy uh, you can exclude the uh, intermediate for them sure. yeah Possibly in the intermediate mass black hole. Because I had the idea, I guess it's not correct, that the intermediate mass black hole were looped in the nucleus of galaxies. Well, intermediate mass black holes can be in small galaxies, yes, dwarf galaxies, for example. But these objects are on the these galaxy. objects are uh, in the outskirts mo most of the time of their own galaxy. So you, you can exclude the uh, intermediate or supermassive black hole. Would, it, would that be compatible the fact that they are nuclear intermediate uh, Yes, if it was in the nuclei of the, of the wrong galaxy, yes, you cannot exclude the these are intermediate mass black holes. Of course, of dwarf galaxies, not of uh, very 
high, very big galaxies. Because you are, you are talking about something like a hundred, a hundred up to a few thousand or tens of thousand solar masses. So it's a it's a big black hole if compared to the galactic ones, but a small black holes. A, a small black hole if compared to the supermassive black hole in the middle of the galaxy. This is a scenario only consider where the source is. Yes. Other place. I have a question, just uh, very naive. Uh, what, uh, I see oh. some similarities more than some with uh, fast reverse. So like the outskirts uh, uh, distance, um, distance from the center and uh, also the periodicity of one uh, ah, uh, yeah. source uh, so very very high hundreds of days and my question is uh, whether it could be the a connection between soft gamma emitters and the galaxies like maybe for the pulsating ones okay so oh, gamma repeat oh, sorry, sorry, also sorry. because for the galactic soft gamma repeater associated with the SRV, uh, it has been uh, observed uh, a very uh, steep, uh, sorry, hard spectrum in the x rays. Okay, soft gamma repeaters uh, are actually isolated in three stars. Mm -hmm. In this case, in this case, not. Okay. So this is one of the main differences. So we are looking at different processes because in the soft gamma repeaters are magnetars in practice, okay. and uh, they can. They have a strong release of energy due to the high magnetic field. And uh, so the emission is due to the strong mag magnetic field inside them. In this case, uh, you have that the emission uh, is due, is powered by the accretion of the matter onto the compact object, not by the uh, magnetic field of the, of the neutron star. But so this is, this is one of the biggest differences. Uh, uh, but yes, it, it was a very, very a good question, actually. Okay, so there is a question, uh, last question from people online. So if you want, Paolo, you can tell your questions. Yeah, it's a very naive question. Just to know if beaming has been detected or, uh, in... Where... Okay, I, I, I can read. So is beaming detected in... Uh, Ultraluminous X ray sources. Uh, beaming is, a, is an option to explain the, the high luminosity. Uh, actually, in the pulsating ULXs, we think that um, a, a, a beaming is, um, is, um, is at work uh, because, uh, because you have to think that the super Eddington accretion has a, a, a strong outflow. So the, the outflow creates a sort of a funnel. And if you look at the funnel, uh, you have uh, um, a beam and emission. So yes, we cannot exclude the possibility that there is, uh, there is beaming. And uh, it's, uh, I would say, one, uh, one fifth, more or less, around this uh, range uh, in terms of order. <laughs> Okay, so uh, there are no other questions. So thanks again to Fabio for the talk. Thank you very much to all the participants and see you soon at the next uh, Jack Seminars. Bye bye. Grazie.